when I was going to school, the words I hated to hear were, get out a little piece of paper. Because I knew that he was going to give us a pop quiz. Now, don't you just hate those pop quizzes? Well, if I could get you to get out a little piece of paper, now I'm going to give you a pop quiz. So here's a little quiz for you. We, we have been looking at Mary and Martha and Lazarus. So question number one. Who were the parents of Mary, Martha, and Lazarus? Okay, number two. Of Mary, Martha, and Lazarus, who was married? Number three. Of Mary, Martha, and Lazarus, who was over 30 years old? Hmm. You know, we just don't know a whole lot about Mary, Martha, and Lazarus, do we? But we know that these are marvelous siblings. They had such tremendous faith. And I have known families just like this. And the whole family was just so faithful to God. I have seen where the grandparents were faithful and the kids were faithful and the grandkids were faithful. Whole generations after generations, these marvelous family, families who had such, have such great devotion towards God. And this is one of those marvelous families. And we get to be introduced to them and know them a little bit. And a couple of weeks ago, I looked at Martha. And what extraordinary faith Martha had. Some people believe that Jesus was the resurrection in life because Lazarus was raised from the dead. Martha believed that Jesus was the resurrection in life before he raised Lazarus from the dead. She had this tremendous faith. And Lazarus, he was the one who Jesus loved. The one you love is sick. I mean, there's this close relationship, this close friendship between Jesus and Lazarus, probably similar to the same relationship that Jesus had with, with the Apostle John. And he, he must have had these, some friends are just closer than other friends, aren't they? And, and Lazarus was one of those guys that's just a close friend with Jesus. And Mary, what do you know about Mary? Well, we're going to look at Mary this morning. We're going to be in John, the 12th chapter, beginning here. In verse 1, we're going to go down through verse 11 and find out a little bit about Mary. It says, Jesus, therefore, six days before the Passover. And let me pause right there for just a moment. Six days before the Passover. Uh, John gives us this little time marker. Just put a little peg in here, a little time marker. Six days before the Passover. You know what that means? We're in the last week of Jesus' life. Uh, we're only in the 12th chapter of John. We have 21 chapters, and he's already in the last week of Jesus' life. And so here in the last week of Jesus' life, Jesus is going to go to Bethany, and they're going to have a crowd join them for something to eat. And so it says, Jesus, therefore, six days before the Passover, came to Bethany where Lazarus was whom Jesus had raised from the dead. So they made him a supper there, and Martha was serving. But Lazarus was one of those reclining at the table with him. Mary then took a pound of very costly perfume of pure nard and anointed the feet of Jesus and wiped his feet with her hair. And the house was filled with the fragrance of the perfume. But Judas Iscariot, one of his disciples who was intending to betray him, said, Why was this perfume not sold for 300 denarii and given to poor people? Now, he said this not because he was concerned about the poor, but because he was a thief. And as he had the money box, he used to pilfer what was put into it. Therefore, Jesus said, let her alone so that she may keep it for the day of my burial. <clears throat> for you always have the poor with you, but you do not always have me. The large crowd of the Jews then learned that he was there and they came not for Jesus' sake only, but that they might also see Lazarus, whom he raised from the dead. 
But the chief priest planned to put Lazarus to death also, because on account of him, many of the Jews were going away and were believing in Jesus. So <clears throat> here is the last week of his life, and uh, we are learning something about Mary in this story. It says that Martha was serving at this dinner. Martha was serving. Uh, <clears throat> it was a culture of the day that the women would prepare the meal and the men would eat in one place and the women would eat in another place. Things haven't changed a whole lot in 2,000 years. Just the only thing that's changed is we let the women eat with us now. <laughs> they're still doing most of the preparation. They're doing most of the serving. And, and here they are. They're, they're, to, they're, they're, they're being served. And around the table is, is Lazarus and Jesus and the 12 apostles. Man, what I would not have given just to be a fly on the wall and listen to that. Just to have Jesus and Lazarus tell their stories. I mean, this one would take the microphone and just pass it back and forth to each other. I mean, just to hear what they had to say, wouldn't it have been marvelous to be there? And they're sitting at the table, it says. Now, it's not like a kitchen table we might be thinking of with chairs and around a table. It was more like a coffee table and they're reclining, laying against the coffee table and the food would be placed there. And while they're laying there reclining at this table, Mary comes along and she begins to anoint Jesus with this perfume, with this costly nard. The other gospels say that she poured it on his head. He poured it on his head and John emphasizes she put it on his feet. She starts pouring it on Jesus' feet. Uh, this costly perfume. You know, I'm not a, I'm not a cologne guy. I'm not one of those perfume guys. I, I, I really don't care a lot for fragrances. Uh, you know, I don't want Lynn to wear a lot of fragrances. She, she has this vanilla spritz stuff she sprays on herself, and she has this uh, Camille Beckman uh, vanilla hand lotion. And, and, and I don't mind that because, well, it, it makes her smell like a chocolate chip cookie. <laughs> and I like cookies. So <laughs> it works out okay. But, you know, a lot of fragrances I, I don't care much for. I, I heard a guy, he said, well, I, I love this one cologne. And the problem is this. $80 an ounce. Uh, $80 an ounce. You've got to be kidding me. But it made me think, what is the most expensive perfume you can think of? Well, I went to the Guinness Book of Records because they, they know all these things. And the 2006 edition tells us that the, the most, most expensive was Clive Christian's number one Imperial Majesty. It sells for $2,355 an ounce. But if you can put that money up, they'll deliver that perfume to your house in a Bentley. <laughs> it's expensive stuff. But it's really hard to know what the most expensive is because the, uh, the DKNY's Golden Delicious perfume sold at a charity auction back in 2011 for $1 million. And they say that in the Emirati Mall, there's a vial of Schumach by the Spirit of Dubai that sells for $1,295,000. Crazy, isn't it? You can have your own perfume made by a professional perfumer, made custom just for you for $55,000. This nard that she poured on Jesus is very expensive. It was imported by Egyptians. Uh, the King Solomon wrote about this. Very rich Roman women loved it. But it was expensive. It was really expensive. In fact, it says there in verse 5, this could have been sold for 300 denarii. Some translations say this could have been sold for a year's wages because that's about what a 300 denarii was. Uh, year's wages. Now, according to the U.S. Census, the median household income in Oregon is $62,818. So you take your $62,000 and you spend it all on a little vial of perfume. Can you imagine that? I mean, if I'm going to spend that much money, it's going to last me for the rest of my life. Can you imagine? You fix your $62,000 on it. Maybe it's some kind of an investment. Maybe it's part of your dollary. I don't know. But you pour it out on someone's feet and not just a little bit. You spill the whole 
whole bottle. You pour the whole bottle out on his feet. That's what Mary does. This expensive vial of perfume. And it fills the whole house with the fragrance of the perfume. And then she does something else that's really amazing. She begins to wipe his feet with her hair. Now, in chapter 13, when we get to chapter 13, we're going to talk about Jesus washing the disciples' feet. And no doubt we'll mention the fact that this was a dirty job. This was a demeaning job. No one wanted this task to wash people's feet. But she doesn't use water. She uses perfume. She doesn't use a towel. She uses her hair. Your hair, a woman's hair, is her glory, it says. And for a Jewish woman... See, Jewish women, they didn't ever cut their hair. Can you imagine how long her hair must have been? And they didn't wear it down. They always wore it up. It was, in fact, it was improper for a Jewish woman to wear her hair down in public. And so here, in front of these men, she pours this perfume on his feet, lets her hair down, and begins to wipe his feet with her hair. Can you imagine such a thing? And you think, what in the world was she thinking? You know, I, I know for a fact she's not thinking, what is everybody else going to think about this? She doesn't care what everybody else thinks about it. She, she just knows that she wants to do something for Jesus, and she begins to do this. She gave him everything that was the most precious to her. She did everything that she could possibly think to do for Jesus. Which makes me think about the idea, what is worship anyway? What is worship? We debate sometimes that what are, what are the acts of worship, what, what constitutes worship. What is worship? So, some folks think, well, I can't worship unless it's loud. Uh, unless we're singing loud, unless we're shouting, unless, we're, uh, unless I can hold my hands up, uh, and it's not worship. Unless I can get up on my feet, that's not worship. For others, worship is lighting a candle and sitting in silence. For some, worship is just sitting back and watching the show. As long as they have a good worship team, maybe they have a good band, as long as they have an inspirational speaker, I'm great. That was a wonderful worship. And uh, it, it's sometimes how it makes me feel and, and what it does for us. And I know people look at worship that way because they say, I just didn't get much out of worship. Or that was inspiring worship. Or that was a spirit-led worship. And when worship is about us, I think we miss the point. We miss the whole point of worship. It's not about how we feel. It's about how God feels. It's about adoring Him. It's about admiring Him. It's about loving Him. Uh, you know, I like to do nice things for my wife. It makes me feel good. But that's not the point of it, is it? The point is to make her feel good. I want her to feel loved. I want her to feel adored. I want her to feel appreciated. And, oh, it might make me feel good, but that's not the reason for it. And our worship, it might make me feel good, but <clears throat> worship can be very selfish. <laughs> very, very selfish. We can forget why we're here. We're not here for ourselves. We're here for God. We're here <clears throat> to honor Him, to sing to Him to pray to Him, to remember Him, to honor Him, to love Him. And for Mary, it's so overwhelming and so consuming. She thinks, what in the world can I do? And she does the very crazy thing of taking the most expensive thing she has and putting it on His feet and wiping His feet with her hair. She's just saying, I'm going to give you everything. I'm not withholding anything back from you. And then there's Judas. And Judas says, oh, wait, this could, have been, this could have been sold and given to the poor. This could be sold to the poor. And John adds in verse 6. I'm so glad John adds this. John adds, well, Judas isn't really worried about the poor. He's a thief, and he pilfered from the, the money bag. And so he wants her to get to the poor. This not only could have been sold, it should have been sold given to the poor. Of course, he doesn't care about the poor, it says. He, he cares about himself. He's greedy. Sometimes we try to give Joseph, uh, Judas the benefit of the doubt. We say, you know what? He sold Jesus for 30 pieces of silver because he's just trying to 
push Jesus' hand. He's just trying to press the situation. He knows that Jesus is going to be the Messiah. He knows he's going to overrule the Romans. He knows he's going to come and be the king. And so he pushes things. And he goes to the priest and he says, I'll, I'll bring them to you. I'll sell them to you for 30 pieces of silver. And he was just overzealous for Jesus' kingdom. No, no, no. John says that's not what Judas was thinking about at all. Judas was a thief, he says. Judas was greedy. That was Judas' motivation. And he says right here that he intended to sell Jesus. He, he's already thinking about this. And, and Judas, though, you know, you never have, you never want to say, hey, wait a minute. This could have been, uh, this money could have been given to the church. And uh, who knows who would have been. It. No, we give it to the poor. We give it to the poor. You, you see, we become pretty clever with what we want. We were pretty good with our manipulations of people. Uh, I mean, just look at how clever people are with, with their slogans today. Love is love. We should be free to choose. We're here for equality. We're here for justice. Now, no one can... Who's going to object to love? <laughs> love is love. Who's going to object to love? But that's not what they mean at all. They mean we should have sexual intercourse with anybody we want, whenever we want, wherever we want. Uh, they're not talking about love at all, are they? Well, we should be free to choose. And who can, who can object to choice? <laughs> but what, that's not what they're saying at all. We should be allowed to murder our unborn children, <laughs> no matter what the consequences may be. I mean... We think about equality uh, and justice and all these slogans being thrown out. Who is going to refute that? And Judas, he's smart. This could have been given to the poor. Well, who's going to ever say, well, wait a minute. Uh, that's not a good idea. Oh, he just knows that no one's going to object. Jesus does. Leave her alone. Leave her alone. Jesus does. Judas just can't grasp what is going on? This, this wasteful extravagance. I, I've heard it called that. A wasteful extravagance. What an extravagant gift. I, I think we need to put extravagance in perspective when you're talking about a king. In the book of Esther, remember the book of Esther? Esther, King Ahasuerus uh, is trying to get a new queen. And so he's having a beauty pageant. He's going to pick out the prettiest girl. And in Esther, the second chapter, verse 12, it says, Now, when the turn of each young lady came to go into King Hashiris, after the end of her 12 months, under the regulations for the women, for the days of their beautification were completed as follows. Six months with oil and myrrh, and six months with spices and the cosmetics for women. Six months with this kind of perfume and six kinds with this kind of perfume, she's going to smell good. And there's not too much that she can have. There's no extravagance here when it comes to a king. When the king of Sheba hears about Solomon, she has to go and see him herself. And in 2 Chronicles, the ninth chapter, it tells us that now when the Queen of Sheba heard of the famous Solomon, she came to Jerusalem to test Solomon with difficult questions. She had a very large retinue with camels carrying spices and a large amount of gold and precious stones. And when she came to Solomon, she spoke with him about all that was in her heart. Then you skip down to verse 9. Then she gave the king 120 talents of gold and a very great amount of spices and precious stones, and there had never been spice like that which the Queen of Sheba gave to King Solomon. Then you go down to verse 22. So King Solomon became greater than all the kings of the earth in riches and wisdom, and all the kings of the earth were seeking the presence of Solomon to hear his wisdom, which God had put in his heart. They brought Every man his gift, articles of silver and gold, garments, spices, uh, weapons, horses and mules, so much year by year. I mean, he could hardly contain it all. He had to build stables and he had to build buildings to hold all the stuff they had for him because there's no such thing as extravagance when it comes to a king. What about the king of kings and the lord of lords? <laughs> I mean, what do you give him that's extravagant? 
I'll tell you what's extravagant to him, though. Extravagance to him is a widow who gives two mites. She gives everything she has. Mary gave something extravagant. She gave what she could. She gave herself. That's what this widow had done. They gave this sacrificial giving. Judas just can't grasp. He can't understand that kind of giving. Now, I'm, I'm amazed. I'm amazed at the level of giving at this church. I uh, was visiting with a lady, and she mentioned the previous church that seemed like all they talked about was giving. And I said, well, I can't remember the last time I would talk about giving here. I said, I think I'd be embarrassed about that because the giving is just so sacrificial. It's just overwhelming. I look at the country, where is this money coming from? I, I mean, wow. And I, I know I get to partake of some of that gift. And we have six preachers that are supported by this. And we do a lot of great things with this. But it's not given for that. It's given because people love God. They love Jesus. And, and they're trying to, to give to him. And uh, wow. You know, Judas, he's like those hucksters, those preachers. You know, oh, give your money. We'll give it to the poor. Well, they're, they're lining their pockets with it. But Judas... He, he's just trying to get what he wants. In a few days, he's going to sell Jesus out for 30 pieces of silver. And he complains. And Jesus says, he says here, Therefore, Jesus, said, let her alone so that she may keep it for the day of my burial. Isn't that an interesting phrase? So that she may keep it for my day of burial. Now, some of the synoptics, I think, say something like, Because she's preparing my body for burial. He says, and John says, well, it was more like so she can keep it for the day of my burial. Don't take this gift away from her. Don't take this opportunity away from her. There seems to be an insight that Mary had that the, the apostles didn't seem to grasp yet. Mary somehow had the insight that Jesus' death was coming. I mean, what gave her that idea? Well, for one thing, there's all this hostility going on. I mean, even the apostles don't want to go to Judea. They say, well, if you go down there, they're going to put you to death. Thomas, remember, let's just go. We'll die with him down in Judea. She knows there's pressure everywhere from people trying to put him to death. Not only that, but where would you get the idea Jesus was going to die? Maybe from Jesus saying it over and over and over again. And I will die and I'll be raised again. And she believed him. And here's the opportunity. Maybe this is my last opportunity. Things are coming to a head here. And she does what she can. She anoints him. And uh, for burial. For burial. Uh, you know, burials. Funerals are kind of interesting. I have been to my share of funerals. <laughs> I think I've been to maybe more funerals than most of us have been to. And I've seen some pretty elaborate funerals. I mean, I have seen some coffins that I used to marvel at. I have seen some wooden, wooden coffins that are just works of craftsmen. You know, if a Jewish person is buried, they can't have a nail in their coffin. Did you know that? No metal is locked. So it's all wood. So you have these dovetailed joints here, this great craftsmanship, and you think, Oh, good grief. That's thousands of dollars. That's beautiful. And they have these flower arrangements, these wonderful flower arrangements, huge arrangements. I mean, sometimes, have you ever been around lilies? I learned I don't like lilies that much. They ferment. And man, you're, you're up here trying to talk and those lilies are really making you kind of feel dizzy. And there's all these flower arrangements, all this stuff around. And can you imagine... In the middle of a funeral, someone gets up and says, What is going on here? What is this coffin? Don't you realize you could have used that money and we could have helped the poor out with that? We could have given it to some homeless people. Why did you spend all this money on flowers? We could have helped so many people with this. There's people living out in the forest. They're homeless. There are people that are poor. There's people that are going hungry. Why couldn't we have done something like that? That ain't going to happen, is it? <laughs> Uh, man, because we don't think of it extravagantly. I saw a woman buried in a dress that had to cost thousands of dollars, one of the most beautiful dresses I've ever seen in my life. We don't think of it as extravagance. We think this is our last opportunity just to say how much we love this person. Just express the, this love that's on our heart. That's what Mary's thinking. I'm just trying to express this love that she has. 
Jesus says, you don't always have me with you. My death is imminent. But you always have an opportunity to help people. He's not saying that we don't help people. He's just saying that, you know, what she's done is a marvelous thing. Verses 10 through 11, it says, The chief priest planned to put Lazarus to death also, because on account of him, many of the Jews were going away and were believing in Jesus. I mean, they just are, this is all coming to head. They don't care. They're going to put Jesus to death. They have to put Lazarus to death. They'll do that, because they just want things to go away. And as I look at this text, I'm thinking, so what's the point? What's the point? What, what, what do I tell you? What do I say? Here's what the point of the sermon is. Is it, uh, now, go and do likewise? <laughs> no, he doesn't say that. Now, go and do likewise. He doesn't say that. For me, it's just, when I'm looking at Martha, remember Martha a couple weeks ago? I tell you, I'm just looking at the text, and I'm just marveling at her extraordinary faith. And I'm thinking, I want faith like that. And when I look at, at Lazarus, and I'm thinking about how close he was with Jesus, and the extent that Jesus would go just to express his love towards Lazarus, I'm thinking, I want to be like Lazarus. When I look at Mary, and I think this is the whole point of the lesson, is when I see how much she loved Jesus, I'm thinking, I want to love him like that. I want to have a love like that. And, you know, there, there are times when I feel like I do. But the thing, I do know this. No matter how much you give to Jesus, and I hope we give ourselves, I hope we give everything to him, whatever it is, it's never wasted. It's never wasted. It shows our love and expression of honor and appreciation for him. What a marvelous thing to love like this.